Okay. Okay, we're live. Um, so Trudy, thank you for helping me kick off this new series called Our Beloved Teachers. And I wanted to start that with one of my own beloved teachers. So thank you again for taking the time to speak about your beloved teachers. Looking forward to this. Thank you, Vince. I am too. I'm excited to be doing this with you and also just very grateful to you for having the vision uh, for this project as we grow older, as your beloved teachers grow older and my beloved teachers, many of them are gone. It feels really important to be doing this. So just, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, um, yeah, I'm really encouraged that that you're interested in doing this. And I know we're you had three beloved teachers um, because you studied for such a long time in the Dharma. And um, I know you studied with each of these teachers. I've heard you share this, you know, at least it seemed like for a decade or more, um, each of these teachers. So that, I mean, that's, that's no small amount of time to be training with someone and getting to know them. So yeah, I'm really thrilled. And they're all Zen teachers, as I understand. So um, very interesting there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just to clarify, today I want to focus on my first teacher, uh, Great. who is uh, the Venerable Reverend Sung San, uh, a Korean Zen master, whom we called Sansanin in the early days. And then when he turned 60, uh, it's a Korean honorific to put the prefix day, which means great, uh, day Sansanin, later years. Mm. So I'll probably... I'll probably refer to him interchangeably um, as Sansanim or De Sansanim. Uh, but one is his his younger name, his younger monk's name. He was a monk, and then one is his his later name. Okay, great. And and clearly you were studying with him before he got the honorific, so your memory is oh, gonna yeah. Oh, yeah. be connected was, to that those times. Yeah, I was studying with him, I don't know, maybe um, just a year or two after he came to the United States, you know, very early on. Um, and he came, when he first came, he didn't speak English. And he, so he got a job repairing washing machines and dryers at a laundromat. And so he worked this very humble job and he had this little apartment in Providence, Rhode Island, where a professor from Brown came, found him, I don't remember how, and came to learn with him and then brought some of his students from Brown who were the very first people, um, people like um, like my husband, my former husband, George Bowman, uh, and others whom I knew. And then they uh, acquired this old funeral home in on Hope Street in Providence, and and that's where I first began to practice with him. And I'll tell you how I met him was really interesting too, because I was seeking, I was really looking for some spiritual guidance. I had had some experiences of openings early in my life that I had nowhere to put those experiences or understand them. And then, uh, like many in my generation, we had experimented with psychedelics. And so we had experienced some sense of expanded awareness, uh, but it was so transitory, you know, and I, I remember feeling like I just, I'm tired of getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden. There must be somebody who understands more about this. And, and you and I talked about some of this in that podcast, The Utter Perfection of Everything. Um, right. So I was searching, and then my childhood friend, he was then Johnny Cabot, now is uh, Dr. John Cabot-Zinn. After he married Myla Zinn, he became Dr. John Cabot-Zinn. And uh, his best friend, Larry Rosenberg, they found this, they found Sansanin. I'm not quite sure how, but they did. And we went together to, he came, this was the really fortunate thing. He came to Cambridge to study English for the summer at Harvard Summer School. And this was, I believe, I can't, honestly can't remember if it was 1973 or 1974, but uh, a friend of ours, Stephen Mitchell, the author, rented a 
big old house on Fairweather Street in Cambridge. And and Sassini was giving a talk there and we went to the talk. And really, you have to understand, I had been seeking. I had been going to here, visiting swamis, and I had been told, you know, eat artichokes and do this mantra. And I didn't like being told what to do. And didn't the mantra didn't appeal to me. And th there were other experiences like that. So anyway, I went along with them, kind of tagging along. And he spoke heavily accented English and talked about things like uh, your mind be poor thinking, which meant before thinking. Uh, and it, that was, I didn't, you know, couldn't really relate to that. I knew nothing about my mind before thinking exactly, uh, exactly, or actually. And um, then he started saying things like, he would point to the floor with his Zen stick and say, the floor is brown. Then he would point to the wall and say, the wall is white. And then outside, the sky is blue, the grass is green. And for some reason, I started crying. I mean, these were not mysterious, you know, hidden truths. Any basically, you know, two-year-old can name those colors <laughs> probably. Mm. Uh, and yet, there was something about the way that he said it and the look in his eye. I felt like he knows what I know. And that he was really trying to say, he said, everything you see is the truth. Everything you see, hear, taste, touch is the truth. And then he said, well, we don't really, you know, you hear that, but you don't know the truth because you don't know yourself. And that really rang true to me. Um, I, and so then I began to practice with him and he was my first meditation teacher. His instruction was very simple. You know, he talked about, uh, the don't know mind, which was also baffling at first. I didn't know what that meant. And he gave this famous instruction. This was our meditation instruction right from the beginning. He showed us how to sit cross-legged on the cushion and hold our, our hands in this mudra. And he said, and you ask yourself, what am I? That's how he said it. Hmm. And, and then he gave us the answer. So that was our koan that we were to work with. You don't usually get the answer to a koan, right? But here was right, the answer. Yeah. <laughs> the teacher doesn't give you the answer. You're supposed to, you know, come up with that through your own. Just intuition. to figure it out. Yeah, through your own intuitive wisdom. So then he says, and here's, here, here's, he says, what am I? Don't know. Hmm. It was just like that. Don't know. Hmm. And of course, he was pointing us to the mystery of consciousness, the mystery of our being, and through, and also that we needed to go through all those layers of identities, the various identities we carry, you know, white, cisgender, we didn't use that word in those days, but, um, you know, mother, daughter, sister, therapist, teacher, whatever our identities are to just like drop underneath all of those roles and identities and then ask, so now what, you know, now what am I? And I love that he said, I mean, you could say, who am I? But there was something about his using the word what that made it even easier to detach from the identities. Like, what is this? What is this body? What is this reality we find ourselves in? You know, what is this? And so that was our meditation instruction that when the mind would, you know, go off into thinking, thinking, thinking to simply come back and pose that question and rest as much as possible in the not knowing. And it was a beautiful training because life is always uncertain. Today, we feel like it's so much more uncertain because of climate change and the global pandemic. But back then, we had nuclear arms race. 
you know, we had uh, Jonathan Schell writing The Fate of the Earth, if there was a nuclear holocaust. I mean, we had the energy crisis in the early 70s. Uh, we thought we had plenty of uncertainty, and I probably at every stage in human history, humans have felt this way, that there's so much uncertainty and so much we don't know. And so beginning to get comfortable with that not knowing and be able, being able to bear not knowing and uh, to rest in uncertainty feels like a great gift that he gave us with that, um, with those instructions. And then he also had a whole curriculum of koan study. Mm -hmm. And I never made it very far through that curriculum. Uh, I don't know if I was one third of the way or where I was um, uh, when I wound up with another teacher, but, but he was so patient and I'm so grateful that I was there right at the beginning, um, not because of being a woman or a pioneer or any of those identities, but because he was available to us. He was around. He used to sit with us. He used to chant with us. He taught us how to eat with our four bowls. The, um, the Korean version of Japanese oryoki had his four bowls and there was a ritual, a kind of ceremony of eating. He ate really fast. And I remember one breakfast at the Providence Zen Center where they served these really delicious thick whole wheat pancakes. And then we always wanted protein. So we put, I, I put a fair amount of peanut butter on them. That takes a while to chew. It's sticky. And <laughs> right. I remember, you know, people were, he had finished, he was starting washing his bowls, which was the sign for all of us to wash our bowls. And there was nowhere to put uneaten food. I remember almost choking to death to, run to swallow those, those, those pancakes. And I'll tell you a memory from my very first uh, retreat with him. He called his intensive re Zen retreats, Young Men Jeonjins. Young Men Jeonjin in Korea means to leap like a tiger while sitting. Hmm. So, this was a, this felt like a pretty unattainable ideal, you know, to be that alert, to be that dynamic and energized uh, <laughs> while you're sitting. Um, but that was, that, that's what he wanted us to aspire to. Mm. I remember when somebody laughed during meditation, you know, they were having some funny memory and they just kind of chuckled and he would say, Ah, thinking, thinking. So hmm. uh, he would name th that distraction. But I remember during this, that first retreat, I uh, woke up, I don't, I think it was the second morning. And it was really hard for me to sit still. And he, again, he was very, very gracious and spacious around. I mean, I don't think I could have been a Zen student if I'd had to start out in a, a Japanese style Zendo. He, he mm -hmm. didn't mind if you switch positions. He didn't mind if you fidgeted. Uh, you could stand up if you were in too much pain. You could stand up behind your cushion. He was very relaxed as long as you were there and you practiced. So I'd been practicing all day and I woke up the next morning and I went into the bathroom. I looked in the mirror, brushed my teeth and for just I don't know how long it was, maybe just a few seconds or a split second, I saw in the mirror this decaying, this blackened face of a decaying corpse. Hmm. I was completely freaked out and horrified. And then, of course, it disappeared. There was just the usual image of me. I couldn't wait to go talk to him. And when it was my turn, I was like, I told him, you know, I saw this in the mirror. I was a, I was a corpse. And he, to my great surprise, he laughed. And then he took his Zen stick and kind of gently tip, um, touched my thigh, like gently tapping uh, my leg. You know, I'm sitting cross-legged right in front of him. We're both sitting cross-legged face to face. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, your body already a corpse? And burst out laughing. And for some reason, I found this mysteriously comforting that he could talk about our mortality 
and, mm. and laugh about it, you know, and laugh about it because this mm. is the way it is. Uh, it is the way it is. So I could go on and on with this teaching, but I want to give you a chance to ask me any questions that you might have so far and then, yeah, I can continue. Yeah, that sounds great. I, I was curious a little bit like of the, I guess the, the kind of logistics of like day to day. Were you, so you were living in Cambridge at the time where he was teaching in the, fu- in the funeral home, the formal, yeah. okay, former let, funeral yeah, home. Let me, the, the, the formal funeral, for, former funeral home uh, <laughs> was in Providence, Rhode Island. Okay. In Rhode and Island, yeah. that's was his base. Okay. In, he lived and worked in Providence and taught there. And everybody okay. lived at that um, former funeral home. And and I think everybody thought it was very fitting that it should be yeah. a sort of renovated, fu- not that it was that renovated, but you know, somewhat funeral home. Uh, whereas in some traditions, that would have been seen as, you know, very inauspicious and there would have been superstition around that. But no, that was very much embraced. And I'll always mm-hmm. remember there was this really ugly kind of dark, kind of muddy pink carpet with swirls on it that was left over from the funeral home days. And, you know, when you're, we would practice Zazen with our eyes lowered, not closed. And, Mm. oh boy, you get to know that carpet and all of the hallucinatory images that appear on that carpet. So that was his home base. Then Stephen Mitchell rented this house on Fairweather Street to start out with while Sansonim came to Cambridge, Massachusetts to the Harvard Summer School to study English. Okay, So he was in Cambridge for the summer and started the Cambridge Zen Center. Wherever he went, he started a Zen Center. I think the next one was New Haven um, because he was invited by Yale students. The next one was the New Haven Zen Center. But wherever he went, he started a Zen Center, and it could be just a living room in somebody's home. But okay. uh, it was whatever space was available. And then somehow, you know, it, to us, it just seemed like he was manifesting, um, I forget the name, um, you know, in India for those <laughs> those Babas who can manifest things, you know, just appear in their palms. It seemed to us he was magically manifesting Buddhas and um, the Korean drums that we used for chanting, which I'll go get mine and show it. And it's beautiful sound, a hollow drum. Um, Nice. Yeah, it's in the other room. I meant to bring it in. He would, you know, he would get us those things, the cushions, the, and I think the Sangha in Korea, the communities in Korea, he was, uh, head of the Chogye order, which is a monastic order in Korean mm. Son or Zen. Mm. And uh, somehow, you know, he was able to provide us with these supplies and then eventually with the gray robes that we wore over our clothes. Mm. And, and so that's how the Zen Center would get set up. And he mm. would appoint whoever was there to be, um, you know, uh, the house master who would welcome people and make sure things were taken care of in the house or uh, the uh, head teacher who may have only been meditating for a year, but was available mm. for that. You know, he would just put people into these roles and wow. people grew into them for the most part. Mm. Sometimes they didn't, but mostly they did. Mm. Um, and, and, and it was very homemade and very organic and very trusting. You know, he had a lot of trust that people would grow into. Uh, And for me at that time, I was uh, in my mid-20s, I think I was 26, uh, when I met him for the first time, maybe just turned 26. I had a five-year-old daughter, and I was already a divorced single mom. So it was a big challenge for me to carve out time to do this because I was... I didn't have an ex-husband waiting in the wings to or helping to support us. So I didn't have weekends off or help with child care. Um, and so I would trade time with other single moms. And there was a little girl who was Hillary's age, uh, Ashley. Her mom was there living in the Cambridge Zen Center. And so sometimes... You know, I would bring Hillary. The girls would play quietly while we 
did our sitting and then we'd have a sleepover and then I could get up very early in the morning. And I remember vividly that, you know, the young people, we were all young people and people talking about, wow, you know, we get up at 415 and we do 108 prostrations first thing in the morning. And they were kind of almost bragging about, you know, enduring <laughs> this tough practice. And I remember thinking, well, if you've ever been a single mom, that's not hard at all. <laughs> you know, it didn't seem hard to me at all. I remember just kind of laughing and yeah, yeah, it was for me, it was a blessing and a privilege and it just wasn't that hard um, mm. Mm. You know, to, to do that practice. And I was, uh, I was working as a, um, at that time, uh, a preschool teacher at a school for severely dysregulated children that I had helped to found. And mm. um, so my schedule matched my daughter's school vacations. And that's when I would trade time and do retreats. And then in the summer, mm. my parents would also take her for a good chunk of time. They were overseas. And they would take her about three mm. weeks so I could do more intensive practice. And that's what I did since Vince with my vacation time. Right. Right. So you were a dedicated Zen student in your kind of all your off time was yeah, practicing that's what I, for the that's most part. What I wanted, that's what I wanted to do. You know, it's really what I wanted to do. Yeah. I was single. I wasn't in a relationship. And so my life was, you know, mothering and working and practicing course i had friends and but then increasingly friends became the friends who were also practicing together right right so, so you had your com your community was yes. also yes. centered around the and also the school Zen center where i worked we were all really it was a small school we had started together and again it was a very sort of organic starting out from scratch process so we were very close to the teachers who taught at that school uh, one of whom also became a Zen student, Alan Shapiro, and all of whom started to meditate. So that was, that was, I remember they all came to my ceremony when I took the precepts. And, and then when Sansanim gave me the 10 precepts of becoming a Dharma teacher later on, they all came for that. So mm -hmm. yes, it was the meditation community and the school where I worked too, which still exists. It, mm -hmm. Today it's called the, um, therapeutic day school and now it goes all the way up to i don't know maybe even eighth grade but certainly through elementary school that's beautiful too mm. um so that's 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 the context for this beginning okay. of to practice okay Okay, great. So it sounds like you were mostly practicing at the cambridge zen center which just sort of was one of these centers that um you know got planted, you know, like a yeah. little seed that just sort of started to grow organically. And you weren't living there at the time though, because you had your daughter, Hillary, and she was young and you were working, but it sounds like you spent a lot of time there because you were practicing. And yeah. where, where did the retreats happen? Did they happen at the Cambridge they Zen Center as well? Right or there. did you? Uh huh. Okay. The longer retreats happened in Providence, the seven day retreats. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's where, you know, that's when I would really need, um, I remember one time John and Myla took care of her for a week so I could go to Sashin. You know, different friends helped me too yeah. because I had my daughter early. I, I've done everything backwards, Vince. I had a child before anyone else did. Well, the good news was my friends could help me uh, babysit sometimes because we were, you know, all knew each other and they didn't have kids. And some of mm. them, you know, they were the ones who were couples, I think were interested in kind of practicing and seeing right, what it was traveling. like <laughs> to have one, <laughs> one around right. the house <laughs> for a week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and Sans, Sansanin used to, he was very clear. He would make, he would give these simple teachings at first and he would say, you, you understand, but you don't really know what I'm talking about. And the reason you don't really know what I'm talking about is because you don't really know the difference between, and, and these were not his words, but this is what he was teaching. You don't know the difference between conceptual understanding and experiential understanding. You know, and he would give us very, always very practical, very concrete, very simple examples, you know, like 
um, you know, I could write volumes on what honey and sugar taste like. But until you come to the Zen Center and you actually taste honey and you taste sugar, you don't really know. You may know a lot about them, but you don't really know how they taste. Um, it, it strikes me that that distinction at the time, like in the, in the early 70s, like that would have been a lot more foreign of a, of a point to make than now, where, the, where it seems like that kind of yes. has almost gotten integrated into our common pop psychology. Well, so many of these teachings have been integrated. Look, the expression, don't know mind, which he coined, right. has become a very widespread expression, especially in meditation circles. So right. a lot of these things that were exciting and new at the time, yes, they've been, um, people know. But even though people know, they haven't always tasted. There's still that, right? Well, that's that's a good point. There's still it's still true, even <laughs> even if you know about them at that level, yeah. That's and it's point. true for a lot of the teachings still too, especially when you get into the teachings that are, you know, the teachings about about emptiness and form and emptiness. And it, again, conceptually, we can understand it, but in fact. <laughs> Do we, have we tasted that? Have we tasted that? Can we understand really what that means? Um, you know, and the other thing I loved about his teaching is he talked about, um, he talked about uh, substance, truth, and action. Like he said, you know, you can understand, he was always teaching we're all one, we're all made of the same substance. Like cookie dough and cookies was the example he used. An example close to my heart, um, cookie dough and cookies. But then he would talk, and he would talk about the truth, the truth of what we see here, taste, touch, right in this moment, this is the truth. And he, it was, he would talk about the emotions too. Anger is truth, sadness is truth, joy is truth, whatever it is that you're experiencing in the moment, this is the truth. And he says, you know, if you can attain that truth, if you can really experience that truth, then you can start to help people. Then you can start to help people who are suffering with their minds. And he also talked about like the correct function of things. And his great, the great example that I, I'll give you two very simple beginning koans, okay? Mm. He would say, what is this? Holding up a cup. This mm. is my water glass. And he'd say, if you say it's a glass, Vince, I'm going to hit you 30 times. He never actually <laughs> hit us. But if you say it's not a glass, if you, if you say it's a glass, I'm going to say you're attached to name and form. And I'm mm. going to hit you 30 times. <laughs> if you say it's not a glass, I'm going to say you're attached to emptiness. Mm. And I'm going to hit you 30 times. So Vince, <laughs> what is it? What is Don't it? Know. Show me. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yes, that's the answer. Those I don't know if you all could see Vince, but here's what he did. <laughs> that's the answer. Now this one's going to be easier for you, Vince. Um, <laughs> now that you passed that co on. <laughs> okay. So, what is this, Vince? If you say it's a bell, I'm going to hit you three times because you're attached to name and form. But if you say it's not a bell, I'm also going to hit you three times because you're attached to emptiness. Now, what is this? I'm glad I have this bell that I think you gave us. So, yep. do you actually ring the bell in the con? How does it work? <laughs> Yay! I well, love can, Zen. So cool. Yeah. So everybody, Vince just passed those two koans with flying colors. <laughs> now I'm going to make him a Dharma teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Except I already did. So <laughs> You could always take it back if I didn't pass the two. So. <laughs> That's yeah, beautiful. So, so direct. Yeah. So he's teaching um, the Buddha's middle way. And he's teaching mm. it concretely, practically, mm. in mm. action, right? 
substance, truth, and function. This is the function of the teaching. And mm. I, you know, I'm a working single mom. I like practical teaching. You know, right. this was very, you know, you could teach me about the middle way between eternalism and nihilism, or, you know, you could teach me the philosophy. And yes, I would understand it intellectually. But this was a way to embody what the Buddha was teaching. And it was brilliant. Um, mm. Or he would, he would do the same thing with sameness and difference. You know? mm. um, let's think of a same or different one. Um, okay, so let's pretend this is my Zen stick. I actually have a Zen stick. You know what? Oh, I'm cool. get my Zen stick and the Korean drum just to show you. Great. So this is a beautiful Zen stick. Um, I'll show you. It's beautifully carved. It belonged to my teacher, um, Maureen Stewart Roshi. It's a lotus vine. And mm. um, I never attained a Zen stick in Sansanim's lineage. Um, and what's the significance of that from the well Zen this is a, it's a teaching stick and and this one was not given to me directly by Maureen um, but but after her death in other words I was not given any kind of formal teaching authorization from her because but that's another story I'll tell all of that when we talk I, I do want to hear that that yeah. we'll get there <laughs> yeah we'll get there we'll get there but for the purposes of what um well, actually, I can do it with the drum. This is called a muktak, and it's a carved uh, Korean drum, a hollow mm. drum carved from one piece of wood, as you can see, very beautiful. It makes a beautiful sound. I don't know what it's going to sound like on Zencaster, but... Um, <laughs> and this is the sound that we would hear. This is the sound that would call you to meditation, to the... And this is the sound that would accompany, accompany chanting. It's almost like a musical mm -hmm. drum. Uh, and so I'm going to give you another koan. So <laughs> <laughs> this drum, <laughs> but you, you, you know, these, you, these are beginning koans and you can, I, I'm giving you, uh, confidence here, Thank kids. You. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. So, this drum, this sound, you hear it clearly, right? So, is this, now he's now, I did, this is the beauty of it. He's now teaching Buddhist psychology and the fields mm. of consciousness, right? Mm. Of course, I don't know that at the time. Um, so this sound, this drumstick, and your mind, are they the mm. same or different? Mm. Yes. If you say they're the same, this drumstick is going to hit you 30 times, Vince. Oh, no, not again. <laughs> the threats. And if you say they're different, <laughs> I'm going to pick up my drumstick and <laughs> wrap you on the knuckles or the head or something. But I won't really do it. But I will hit you 30 times. So um, why do you get hit whether you say it's the same or different? Why? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Okay. So that's yeah. – where does that that's put nice. you? You see, it puts you back into the mind that really doesn't know things like that. Mm. Only hears – knows the true in the truest way so these are those are some of the ways that um mm. that he taught that he taught us um and one of my favorite stories just of the simplicity of his teaching which i found to be also really profound and i wasn't the only one obviously mm. um at a Dharma talk once, somebody asked him this, a wonderful question, because he would always teach us you should have um, great faith 
great doubt and a great mm-hmm. question. You know, those are the three, the three qualities that you need for the practice. You need great faith. You have to really believe in yourself. And that's something he taught over and over again. Believe in yourself. You know, trust yourself. He said, believe in yourself, but trust mm. yourself. Trust your perceptions. Believe that you're seeing clearly. Yes, you can tell the sky is blue or it's gray or it's, you know. And then the great um, great doubt is the willingness to inquire. It's inquiry. You know, it's the willingness to to look deeply and not just to sort of take things at their surface, face value. And then having a great question, the existential question of all humans, you know, where do I come from? Where will I go when I die? Why am I here? What is my life for? So those are the three qualities. So he probably, I don't, I don't recall, he probably had given a Dharma talk about that. And then a woman raised her hand and said, so what is great faith? And he held up his little finger and he said to her, do you see this? And she said, yes. And he said, that is great faith. Hmm. I loved him. You know, he had a big, big beaming white smile, wide smile, very cheerful, um, always very cheerful. He could get very mad. But he would always say it was just teaching anger. <laughs> was, you know, as for that, I don't know. <laughs> but he was just himself in such a glorious way that it gave you permission to be yourself and who you are. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he mm-hmm. could be tender, too. I mean, I remember one young man judging when Zen retreat in Providence. It was in the summertime and it was really hot and muggy. I don't have to tell you about hot and muggy. You live um, mm. in North Carolina and it's summer. And we, it was a work period because our days would be divided into sitting and walking meditation and work period and then meals and uh, so forth. And I remember I was cleaning out the kitchen cupboards and just sweating <laughs> and feeling a little bit put upon, like <laughs> a little discouraged, you know, the mind, why am I doing this? What am I doing here? <laughs> you know, that kind of, and I remember he walked past and he would be in his under under underwear. It was hot. You know, he'd be in his baggy gray Korean monk pants and just a little undershirt. And I'll just remember he he put his hand on my back. He just like patted me on the back. It was like, I'm sure I was drooping. I'm not implying that he necessarily was reading my mind, but he would be very, um, he could be very tender and encouraging um, as mm. well as very strong. Um, you know, and, and and I just love the way he talked. He would say, you know, even though I've finished my talk, I know that um, some of you are still not clear. I've given you a talk, but you're still not clear. And he'd say, you know, your mind is the thing that carries around this body. But you don't understand what is my mind? What is my mind? And if you understood your mind, then everything I said to you would be crystal clear. Hmm. You know? um, and and then he said, uh, he said, if we keep on practicing, finally we enter this realm of this. These are his words. Finally, we enter this realm of enlightenment. Then everything we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch, all is clear. Before our idea of self, our eye was obstructing the truth. But if you take that away, then there's nothing preventing us from becoming one with the universe. So this was a frustrating thing for me as a 20-something, very wrapped up in my emotions and my um, confusions in life and my attachments to people and things and um, especially, you know, my own feelings. And, you know, he was a a man, number one, and a Korean monk, number two, from a different culture, an Asian culture, where um, 
the expression of emotions is treated differently. Um, although I will say in Korea, it's, it's definitely more expressive and open than some other um, cultures in East Asia. And he, but not publicly so much. Um, and um, he would say to us, you know, we would bring our problems to him. <clears throat> many problems, many things that we can look back on today, the way we might look back on, the way you might look back on your, you know, your young son's problems and see, well, they weren't really that big or serious. But at the time for him, for Xander, when he's having a problem, it's just as huge as when we're having a problem. It's the same thing. Right. Right. So here I am having my huge 20 something problems and asking his advice. And he would often say, put it all down. Just put it all down. Man, from his perspective, I can see what he means in completely today. Of mm. course, just put it down. That's all you need to do. It only exists mm. in your mind. Um, <laughs> even if it's a real life situation, chances are it's not exactly the way you're perceiving it anyway. Mm. So, but when he would say that, I don't, I was a rebellious person. I would just rebel and think, no, this is important. I'm not going to put it down. So I would have been a much better Zen student <laughs> <laughs> if I had known how to put it down. But in my defense, and I wasn't alone, of course. You know, he he didn't study psychology. He didn't mm. understand some of the things that I think Western psychology has really brought to and enriched the Dharma with, mm. understanding the emotions and understanding in a more nuanced way than just stop it, how to work with them. Because put it all down was really just stop it. And right. I don't know if you ever saw that classic Bob Newhart therapy um, video where he talks with a client, client comes, I mean, it's hysterical. And his whole method of therapy is to <laughs> yell, stop it at her when she begins <laughs> to talk about her problems. <laughs> well, just stop it then. Um, yep. Oh, but my mother, no, no, we don't go there. So it was a little bit that kind of method that... <laughs> <laughs> that he was using. And as I said, I think that this is something that, um, you know, that, that Western, uh, Western psychology has brought and helped and enriched the Dharma with. Mm, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he also was very, very focused on and, and helped us um, uh, focus on, uh, bodhisattva practice, he called it, which mm. is basically helping other people who are suffering. Um, you know, it was very clear, straight Zen. If you're hungry, eat. If someone else is hungry, feed them. Mm. You know, very, very, very simple and very profound. Um, Did that take any particular, like, formal form? Like, did you all like students get together and go to like the soup kitchen and feed people or did, was it more just like kind of pointing to that as like how you live your life and when it arises it was pointing to that as how it. you live your life really mm -hmm. very practically how you live your life and he wasn't mm -hmm. you know the zen center was a training place so the way it would be expressed in the zen center was by helping each other um mm. and service to the center that needed things all the time of course, mm -hmm. but, um, but it was really about how we lived our lives. And uh, he also, one thing I forgot to say when I was talking about those early meditation instructions, which is important, you know, when you, he would teach us with the koan, whether it was what am I or a later koan that you might be working on, which were called kungan, kungan in the Korean mm -hmm. tradition, that how you work with your kungan is like this. Let's say uh, you lost your wallet somewhere in the house, mm. right? You just can't find it or your keys, whatever it is. You don't go from room to room saying, where's my wallet? 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 You just look for your wallet. Mm. 
So the koan is not like a mantra. You just say it over and over and over. What am I? What am I? What am I? What am I? In this sort of rote way, you look, you inquire deeply, what am I? And then the way that he taught for keeping that kungan in your awareness so that you weren't lost in thought all day long, like during the day when you're not meditating and you're going about your business, um, you know, your work, your child care, the other things you're doing. The example that he would give was of, <laughs> who talked about this, a Korean widow. So she's alone and she has a son who is her only child. And he has to go off. He, he joins the army. He has to join the army. And this is, you know, this is her only son. She's always thinking about him. I want him to do well in his studies. You know, I want him to have the right friends. I want him to get married and be happy. She's totally devoted to him. And then he has to, um, he has to go away. He has to join the army. And so she's thinking about him all the time until he comes back. Every day he's in her heart. And that's your come on. Hmm. To, to just keep it with you the way you would keep a loved one who's away and you're hoping hmm. they'll get to come back. Hmm. Um, hmm. You know, Again, very practical support mm. how, how to do these things. Mm. Um, there was another teaching that I wanted to share with you. Um, oh, do you have any questions before I go I, on? Because I, I, I go on I did, and on, obviously. I'm no, really this is enthusiastic. Great. Yeah, no, this is great. Um, it was interesting, that last example you gave, just again, kind of a little comment. Um, it seems like on the one hand, that's really easy to relate to for a lot of folks, but then for other people, you know, I could imagine, you know, that are more about individuation and they're, you know, like they've kind of in their psychological, in their psychological history, they may, you know, be like, no, like, I don't just think about my family all the time. Like I'm my own person. I could yeah. see how, you know, that's very cult sort of culturally connected. Yes. And also... Um, kind of would re resonate with people at a certain stage in their own psychological development more than perhaps someone who's, you know, so, kind of more in that individuated. So uh, let's think of phase. it as for somebody who's, you know, earlier in their own life um, or their own development. And, he, you know, you could think of it this way. These are not examples that I ever heard him use, but, you know, if you have a crush on somebody, yeah, you fall in love, right? right? You think about them right. a, a lot. The music you hear, the, the, you know, you, you keep them in your heart. Or if you are just yourself and growing up, you can think about how much you care about yourself and what happens to you. You know, just he, he's trying to yeah. show ways that you could bring some emotional connection to caring about this kongan, which, you know, those stories, yes. they're ancient stories. They aren't culturally relevant for the most part. It's through our own intuitive wisdom of practice that would make them alive and relevant. Bring them yeah. alive. Yeah. 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 I, I remember doing uh, inquiry practice with you and you used that example of the, the keys and the wallet. And I often share that with folks as well. Yeah. I didn't know that that's where it came from, but yeah, it's it a really, it's, it's a very good um, pointer. It's, yeah. No, you, that came from, that came directly from, from Sansanin. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. And at the beginning, he also taught us, I remember we would just sit on the floor, you know, in the, we didn't call it the zendo, that's a Japanese word, we called it the Dharma room. Um, we would sit on the floor and he had this big white pad and he had a beautiful um, calligraphy. He would write these teachings in Korean and then Becky Burnham, who has since passed away, she, she was the youngest student. I think I was 25 or 26. Becky was 19, and we used to commiserate us mid-20s. We'd say, oh, God, Becky's so lucky. She started to practice when she was young. Nice. <laughs> right? <laughs> but Becky had this very beautiful um, uh, way of printing her calligraphy. So she would translate the teachings. And at the beginning, he taught us 
Four Noble Truths, the Three Marks of Existence, sort of basic Buddhist teachings. But then later, all of that was encoded in the uh, the Kongans and mm. um, and his unique way of having these sort of Dharma sound bites, um, like fall down a hundred times, get up a hundred and one times, or just keep your try mind, only try, try, try. You know, he had a lot mm. of these phrases. Um, but he also talked about how Buddhism was very practical um, and mm. very consistent in its teaching. And here again, he would say it's very consistent in its teaching, its practical application, and its function, how it works. Um here are some of his words. He says, um, almost all religions have some kind of opposites thinking. For example, I must call upon God for help. I must pray to God or I must, must reach somehow a God outside of myself. But Buddhism teaches that if you practice and attain your true self, then you become Buddha. In the Christian Bible, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But most people don't understand the meaning behind this. What is the meaning of the way? What means to return to the truth? What does that mean? And then he goes on with his teaching. Everything you see, hear, taste, touch is already the truth. What is not the truth? The sky is blue. The tree is green. The dog is barking. The sugar is sweet. Even though we live this truth all the time, we don't know truth because we don't know ourselves. Again, coming back always to what he called the primary point, you know, what is the meaning of life? And he was, it was beautiful. He said, this life means helping all beings. And he devoted his whole life to that, you know, for better, for worse. Um, he made mistakes. Uh, he was a human being. For example, in the early years, um, he was having an affair. This was a very, very early on with just a few students. He was having an affair with one of them, and everybody knew about it. It was, it was just, he just loved her, you know. And um, what I've discovered later is that at a certain point, it's okay. I mean, there's, I guess that for a monk to have a special friend, I don't know, maybe it's tolerated in certain circles in Korea. It is, or it was, um, but we didn't know those things. And then later, uh, ma many years later, that student actually wound up getting married and so forth, having a daughter. But later, uh, there was another person who like the first one, also became a teacher, had a relationship with him. These were these were relationships, you know, and yet he was encouraging the people, he was encouraging some people to become monastics and that they should be celibate. When they found out that he hadn't always been, he, he had right. this other person, but she, somebody in Korea who was more like a colleague. I met her once. She was more like a colleague. Um, she taught through psychic stuff. But um, when they found out, they felt betrayed, totally betrayed. And you can imagine if you're struggling to be celibate and then you find out your teacher who told you to be an ax like a monk isn't, right? They got very upset. Yeah. Um, and so it created this kind of scandal at the time. But here's the thing. Um, Satsunin did something that I've never heard of another teacher, especially an Asian man, a Korean man, or doing um when people got very upset was of course disruptive for the community and he went to all of his zen centers and he convened everybody who wanted to be there he prostrated himself did a full prostration bowed repented apologized and listened to them, sat in wow. the center of that circle and listened. Mm. You know, I, I, I know of a, a female teacher, um, 
Egyoku Roshi at the Zen Center of Los Angeles. She did not do any engage in any kind of misconduct herself, but her teacher, Maizumi Roshi, did. Right. And she just how she brought people back into trust of the Zen Center was just spending hours and hours listening and listening and listening. Now, I don't think Sansa spent hours and hours in each place listening, but the fact that he was willing to humble himself and offer a bow, um, it made a huge difference. It really did. And I mention this because I know that sometimes you can hear the name of a teacher and associate that teacher with the scandal that they got into or something like that. Right, it's right, just right. much, much more nuanced and interesting than that. Um, and I'm not saying it's okay that he slept with people who were also his students. Um, I don't condone that. But in the early 70s, things were very different from the way they were later on when the Zen Center's became more populated and there was um, a need for more uh, boundaries and organization and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's, you know, this life means helping all beings. If they're hungry, give them food, right? If they're thirsty, give them water, uh, something to drink. When you meet somebody's suffering, you just help them. And this was really, um, inculcated in us that we need to understand who we are, that we need to understand our own minds. We need to wake up so that we can really help other people. Okay. Yeah. There's okay. So there's, there's, you've brought up so many things now that I want to circle back around to um, uh, one, this is more of just a practical training thing, but like, what was the chanting like? Um, did you oh, all yeah. chant in Korean? The chanting. I'm laughing because, oh, that became, <laughs> it started out with these chants that they were all in Korean or transliterated from Sanskrit. Um, okay. Some of the Durrani's were transliterated from Sanskrit um, into a Korean transliteration uh, or in Korean. And it started out that there was a half an hour of chanting I mean, I can still remember the chants, you know, you hear the mok talk, I still remember. Uh, not, don't worry, I'm not going to chant for half an hour. Um, Kayam, Jung, Yang, you know, you begin the chants. And that was great. Um, they were melodic, which I really liked because um, in the Japanese zendos, they're not melodic. They were, they had tunes. Um, the chant, mm -hmm. the chant for, uh, there was a beautiful chant to um, the Bodhisattva Kwan Seon Bosal in Korean, Kwan Yin in China, Kwan Seon in Japan or Kanan. Um, beautiful chant. Uh, I still chant that one sometimes. And they had tunes, but then it expanded. And there was a morning bell chant that went on and on. Beautiful chants. And he had a beautiful chanting voice. But, you know, if you're working and you're raising kids and you're an hour of chanting in the morning and then sitting after you've done 108 prostrations, it just, the practice time got very extended. Um, and that was also how he taught us at the beginning. At the very beginning, we ate on plates. And then he introduced the four bowls practice when he felt people were ready. You know, he, he um, I'm sure there are some people who really love the chanting. The chanting, though, is a way for people to understand oneness, you know, chanting mm. together. He called right. it together nice. action. Mm. And, and chanting together, there are moments when you lose yourself. And I remember one moment when, you know, everything just popped into sort of oneness. And, and afterwards, he came up to me and gave me that pat on the shoulder and said, hmm, chanting, huh? <laughs> like he could, I don't know how he knew, but I guess if you pop into that space, he's there, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. And I did mm. live in the Zen Center for a period of maybe five months at one point um, when my daughter mm. was a bit bigger because I was, I wanted to. Um mm. And it was great. I loved it, being able to practice that much with everybody. 
but it was aggravating too, you know, to live with people who aren't your chosen people to live with. And he talked about it as um, potato, boiling potatoes. And as the potatoes boil, they automatically, they rub up against each other and they get peeled. So right. never, it, it's not a pleasant process, but you would get peeled. Um, <laughs> and I, I moved out because it really wasn't that great um, for my daughter. It was, she felt a little embarrassed when she had friends over. It was a weird place. And mm. also she loved, she would, same thing every single day. She liked this certain little sliced turkey in a packet in her lunch in a sandwich and it was a vegetarian household mm. and people would be upset that the turkey was in the fridge for her lunch. Right. Um, and the turkey would disappear. <laughs> people would eat it. <laughs> anyway, there right. were just things like that. It was clear that, you know, she needed a dresser to put her clothes in. <laughs> you know? um, we didn't, mm -hmm. we didn't, we didn't stay there, but, yeah, that's, that's really, that's really interesting. I mean, it, um, yeah, it occur, it occurs to me, yeah, that you were in one way, yeah, you're balancing these two very different traditions, like the, 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 the single, single parent, single mother on the one hand, and you've got like, you're responsible, completely responsible for your child's life. And then on the other hand, like a serious committed practitioner in a monastic tradition, like, yeah. Um, it's, it, it strikes me too. Like, it sounds like it, 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 it very much sounds like, uh, San Sanim was, um, a, a lot more flexible than some of the stories I hear about some, uh, Zen and Chan San he teachers who come very over flexible, like very relaxed and flexible. And yes. like, oh, we're going to transition you to the four bowls instead of like yeah. right off the bat, you just got to jump right into this completely culturally different environment and just get with the program sink or swim kind of thing. I mean, that, that strikes me as being a lot different than a lot of the things I've heard of, uh, about other training, other trainings and teachers at that time. Yeah, he had a lot of wisdom that way. He really did. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he had a lot of wisdom that way. What was interesting is that, um, I don't know if it was a year or two, a couple of years into it, um, again, uh, John and Larry discovered, I, he said, they said, you know, there are these people, they sit for a whole hour, they don't move. Um, anyway, it turned out to be the Vipassana people because Jack and Joseph and Sharon had started teaching. And I remember talking to San Sanim about it because I wanted to go to a Vipassana retreat. I had, I had two weeks that my parents were in the States and anyway, I had childcare and I had the time off work and, and he, again, he was very spacious. He was like, sure, sure. You can go. He said, but you're going to see, you'll be more worse when you come back. And <laughs> <laughs> And I went, to, it was, it was before they had Barry. It was a, a camp in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. I went, John Kabat-Zinn was there, Larry Rosenberg, Ram Dass was there. There were all these people mm -hmm. who later, you know, became luminaries were at this retreat. Yeah. And, um, it was great. I got so concentrated because Sansanin wasn't focusing on Samadhi and building Samadhi. Mm -hmm. He was, you know, he was up to something. A little bit different. Anyway, I got so so mm. concentrated, but then I discovered he was right because when I came mm. back, everything was mm. an impingement on my samadhi. Even my daughter right. it was so hypersensitive, and and mm. I thought, yeah, I'm worser. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, made me really, wow. uh, really appreciate Zen. But I also yes. continued practicing vipassana. And honestly, people often ask me, well you know, which, which it was just depending on when I had childcare and when there was a retreat. So I did mm -hmm. keep practicing with, with them. And I also, I loved that practice too. And mm -hmm. that became a theme in my life, just really loving the Dharma in all its traditions and all its mm -hmm. manifestations. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I like that very, it's very practical difference there though, um, that you're pointing to. Yeah. And, and he uh, knew it too. Yeah. I mean, I wonder how he knew, like, is that part, was that part of his, did he train in that kind of concentrated no. way? I wonder. No, I don't know how he knew, but I, I don't know. 
actually how he knew. But he was friends with Mahagosananda, mm. who was a Cambodian monk who um, fled Cambodia during the Khmer Rouge time. Anyway, when when Mahagosananda came to the States, Sansanin helped him. He stayed at the Zen Center for a while. He, I think he helped support him for a while. And that was definitely a Theravada monk. So maybe yes. you know, they probably had conversations. Some cross-cultural exchange there. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't know the um, you know, exact sequence of all that. I, I want to go back to, to to what you're saying about the you know the, the the scandal, because that's such a common theme as well in, in during that time period. I mean, and even later, and especially it seems like in the in the Zen uh, traditions. Like I remember talking to Mark Oppenheimer about that book he wrote several years ago, the the Zen Predator of the Upper East Side about Edo Shimano Roshi, and I mean it seems like there's like legitimate differences between someone who like Edo Shimano, from what I can tell and what I've heard, like who's kind of like almost is kind of like predatory in their behavior toward women. Mm -hmm. And then these other circumstances, which where there's a lot, like you're describing, there's cross-cultural differences that make it hard to understand, um, you know, what's expected or what's, un, you know, what's understood to be okay or not okay. That doesn't get like, make it in the translation. Um, and then there's, just the difference of the historical cultural time period, you know, we're in the post me too, uh, period now where we're, you know, like, I think culturally very attuned and sensitive to the power differentials. And, and like, as you said, you know, Western psychology and the boundaries that got integrated that you were, you know, you were a big part of that movement to kind of inter bring those two together. I mean, this was all before that. So I think it's easy to forget, yeah. you know, in some ways that, that like we learned the hard way and I say we meaning you, <laughs> you all. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I want to also say it's not, you know, therapists knew about the boundaries and these power differentials for a long, long time. And mm. we're, we were trained in that, which is some of, I mean, I was a meditator before I became a therapist, but, um, mm. but then I got trained in all of that. And I, I think I can't, his name was Paul Rutter wrote a book called sex in the forbidden zone long long time ago about mm -hmm. clergy uh in general who would get you know seduced or fall into that kind of behavior and didn't understand that a student's transference is just that you know they mm -hmm. may seem to be in love with you they think they're in love with you they mm -hmm. have a crush on you for sure they're idealizing you Right. And, you know, for we learned about this as psychotherapists, particularly if you're a middle aged man, maybe feeling your powers in certain areas starting to wane. Or, right. you know, to have a younger woman be uh, essentially fawning over you and thinking, and you know, your marriage, you've been married for decades, your wife isn't thinking that every single thing you say is brilliant anymore. Um, <laughs> You know what I mean? She's not getting tears I in her eyes when you say certain things <laughs> because it's so moving and brilliant. Uh, you can imagine. It's very, very seductive. You know, I mean, I experienced it myself. I, I remember I was teaching um, a Zen retreat. Uh, it was a week-long retreat. And there was a man who was just very devoted. He had a very devotional kind of bhakti nature. And he came and he was cute too, younger man. Um, not that much younger, right? Uh, and he came in for his one-on-one uh, -on -one meeting with me and he did a bow and then, and I was barefoot, you know, in the um, practicing barefoot and, and then he kissed my toes. And I remember I got this just beautiful shiver all through my body, this handsome man, and, and it was ticklish, right? And it was sexy. And I thought, mm. oh, this is how it happens. Mm. If I were lonely, if I were vulnerable, if I didn't understand about the boundaries and the transference and these kinds of things, right. um, this is how it happens. But that was many years later. What I want to say, and I feel the same way about the Me Too movement, while all of this awareness is key, it's got to be, you know, um, I mean, because most of the predatory behaviors 
come from men, not all, but most, and mostly, not all, but most toward women. Um, and I, I don't want to start going into examples and so forth. I just want to say that in our zeal to stop this kind of abuse, sexual abuse and misconduct of various kinds, there is often a lack of nuanced thinking. You know, let's just look at some famous examples. There is a difference between Al Frankel, who is a comedian who once put a hand jokingly on a woman's breast laughing photo. Okay, he's out of the Senate. And Harvey Weinstein, who was a predatory mm. creep. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? Like, so totally. to me, there's a difference between teachers like Edo Shimani Roshi, who to me, there's a question of, is there a pattern? You know, right. is this person, is there a pattern where this repeats over and over again? Is it a one-time slip that happened? It's still not okay, but that's different. It's different. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how, and how that person handles the slip, like you said, there, exactly. that's, that's a really actually pretty important and, and uncommon for someone to, it's huge to, to apologize. Yeah. People are told by their lawyers, you know, deny, don't apologize or what. I don't know. I want to apologize to the lawyers. I'm not sure where that advice comes from. <laughs> or lawyers. Um, but I, know, I really want to apologize. Both Jack, my current husband and I have daughters who are lawyers. So I don't uh -huh. want to malign lawyers. Um, Fair. <laughs> but, you know, people. Yeah. You said it. I don't need to say it again. How the person handles it whether there's deception or continued deception, whether there's honesty and remorse, genuine. I mean, Sansanim was genuinely chastened and contrite mm. um, and apologetic and open about it. Mm. Whether things are secret or open is not the only criteria, but, you know, um, it's a big topic and I just want to make a, plea for a nuanced, a more nuanced understanding of it before, you know, people are, people love to gossip. It's human nature and love to shriek scandal. And, and then there's another point too, which I think has to do with the middle way in Buddhism and the way that Sansanim taught. Can you hold in your mind that somebody, I think of mm. Sasaki Roshi here, that somebody could mm -hmm. be a powerful, profound beneficial teacher and somebody who engaged in regular sexual misconduct does right. that mean all their teachings should be wiped out from all the archives of you know lion's roar and all the places you know my beloved teachers all the places where we're recording right um, you know how do we hold all of these things and and I remember Sansanim looking right at me once during a Dharma talk and saying, don't make opposites. Don't make a line. Don't make good and bad and right and wrong. Don't make opposites. Because I had a pretty judgmental mind at the time. And I did feel he was speaking directly to me, but of course he was talking to everybody. Um, and... And so I think for all of us to try not to make opposites, but to hold a more nuanced right, uh, view, it, it takes some maturity to do that. And you can't do that mm. if you've experienced teacher misconduct yourself. You have to heal from the part of it. That, that can be very traumatic. It certainly was for me in my mm. life. And you have to heal from that before you can have a more balanced view of things. Right, right. Yeah, thank you. No, I just, it is such an important topic and I have a feeling it's going to be a recurrent theme in this series because it's just part of the history, you know, and I don't want to shy away from that. It's uh, more like what you're saying, how to, how to not make opposites or um, hold the both and-ness of it. You know, it's like both things can be true, two things are certainly be true at the same time. And I see that in all the teachers that I've gotten to know well, you know, that I've like really spent time with where it's been so cool actually to see that it's not 
it is disappointing initially, but then it's actually liberating to be like, oh, you're a profound yogi and you have issues with alcohol or you're, you know, you're like this amazingly kind person and you, you know, get pissed and you know, kick the dog or something, you know, like <laughs> human, you have flaws. Yeah. We're all yeah. human. Yeah. Yeah. It? The bar the bar lowers a little. <laughs> when it's... What's that wavy gravy used to say? We're all bozos on this bus. <laughs> wavy gravy. I'm glad wavy gravy got quoted. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, he's got so many good quotes. I've never heard that one. That's great. I think <laughs> that was quotes. him. He also <laughs> said, the one you've probably heard me quote, um, it's really my favorite. If you don't have a sense of humor, it's not very funny. <laughs> that one I've heard. That's good. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I, I want to maybe um, just ask about like, the community and your experience as um, as uh, Sun Sanim got more popular, because I know eventually um, the Quantum Zen School was founded, and I know he became like an extremely popular teacher. Um, and you said you were able, really, you're in on the ground floor, you know, and so you were able to really have a, a, a real human relationship. But how did that change as you were as you were studying in the community? Did it change, uh, or or did that happen more after? You'd kind of um, it happened gone in gradually. It happened mm. gradually. And remember, I wasn't there in the later years, most mostly. But mm. I'll come back to that. It happened gradually. What I remember vividly is that he used to be with us practicing all the time, and then he wouldn't be. And I remember feeling bereft. You know, it's sort of like your daddy just walked out on you or something. I mean, he'd be in his room making phone calls in Korean probably ordering the Buddhas and the mats and stuff. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> you know? right. um, he'd be doing other things. And, and I remember just feeling just mildly abandoned um, as he became less available, or then he would be at the New Haven Zen Center or he would be teaching a retreat. He started, you know, the Empty Gate Zen Center in Berkeley and the, mm. uh, it was called Talmasa. Um, which still exists, a Korean Sangha that he had in Southern California, and then the Dharma Zen Center in LA. And so he would be, even before he had centers all over the world, he would more and more, had more centers and began to travel more. And he could do that too, because there were more senior students now who were really grounded in the practice and could lead the practice. Uh, he still would be the one who would teach the retreats. And when he, but he, what, oh, what, oh gosh, this was so awful. One of the things that he required of you once you've been practicing for a while is that you, and not a long while either, is that you give Dharma talks. Oh my mm. God, it's excruciating. He, and, and he just wanted you to share your practice and what you were learning with your, your friends, essentially, or, you know, people who would come. Mm. And yet being young, being unbelievably anxious uh, about mm. public speaking and being a shy person anyway at that time, you know, pretty shy. Um, oh, that would just, I would be sick all day, literally to my stomach. Um, and then he would sit, oh, because he would sit right next to you. That would be, so you had to do it in front of him. Mm. And, um, you know, it was only 20 minutes. When I think mm. back, you know, it was fine. And then he would do the questions and answers with people. So mm. as he, but then as, you know, he made people teachers and then they could give the talks and he didn't have to always be there. He couldn't always be there because he was establishing this international network of centers. Right. right. And I really wasn't part of all of that, but I came back later Um because I was married to George Bowman, who was, he and Bobby Rhodes were his two original Dharma heirs who received this full Inca ceremony, this full transmission ceremony. There was a big chorus that came from Korea. These elderly Korean Zen masters were brought over. I mean, it was a huge shindig. And, mm. and when I was married to George, uh, he was also practicing with Sasaki Roshi 
And again, Sansanim was very spacious and generous about that. Mm. Um, but we went to uh, on a pilgrimage to the ancient Zen temples in Korea with him in 1987. And so I traveled with him and I remember he wasn't pleased that we got married. I think he always wished George would have been a monk. And I remember mm. at first he would just give me these side glances and he wasn't <laughs> loving the way he used to be. <laughs> um, mm. But I loved Korea and really got into that trip. And by the end of that trip, you know, I was very effusive with him about how much I loved Korea. We met these amazing practitioners and calligraphers of the temples. And it was a wonderful trip. And, uh, and it was hard, too. I mean, sometimes we'd arrive someplace, there was nowhere to sleep. We'd lie on the cement floor behind the Buddha or something. And I remember one place gave us, they had carpet remnants for blankets. I mean, you know, it wasn't, some places were nice, <laughs> but some places were really tough, but I loved it. And he saw that. And at the end of that trip, he said to me, now you can, now you must teach with Georgie. He called him Georgie. Uh, mm. And that was also a great blessing. Mm. But I wasn't around the Zen Center that much. Um, mm. You know, I just was practicing with different people at that point. Mm. Fully answer your question about what it was like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it almost sounds like as things got, as he got busier, it almost sounds like you also at the time were kind of branching out. Like they yes. they almost went together, yes. which makes sense. Yes. Yeah. And and is there a certain time that you'd say like you were no longer kind of studying with him closely? Is there like a certain point that you could uh, yeah. kind of identify? Yeah, in the late 70s, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think by 1978 or so, I after about five years, I wasn't studying with him intensively. And that happened because I met um, Coben Chino, uh, who never called himself Roshi, but now is Coben Chino Otagawa Roshi Otagawa, is I think his family name. And... I met Coben and practiced with both for a while. And then, you know, looking back, <laughs> looking back, Vince, I didn't have to leave Sansanim. I didn't have to turn in my Dharma teacher robes formally. Right. Um, but I did it, I think, because I wasn't really coming to the ceremonies. I wasn't really participating and giving of myself to the community. Right. And, um, I always felt close to him, but I did kind of formally end that uh, by returning the robes. And mm -hmm. yeah, I feel a little sad when I think about it now. But and then I, I when he was um, when he was in Korea ill and before he died, I wanted to see him and just thank him, thank mm -hmm. him because the more I practiced Vince, the more I understood his teachings. Mm, you know, there were things right. he said that didn't, I mean, I heard them, but like he said, you know, but you don't really know. Mm. And as I began to really know later on what he was teaching and have flashes of just such immense appreciation, I wanted to go back and tell him. But mm. um, he was pretty ill and people who had been with him said, remember him the way he was, it's better. Mm. And, you know, it was a big deal to go to Korea, uh, the same issues um, now. But I think I would like to, if you don't have another question now, Vince, I'd like to Please. close with a poem that Satsumi. Please. Great. He said, a famous Zen poem says, coming empty-handed, going empty-handed, this is human. And then his poem, which I really love, is this when you are born where do you come from when you die where do you go life is like a floating cloud which appears death is like a floating cloud which disappears the floating cloud originally does not exist life and death coming and going are also like this but there is one thing which always remains clear. 
It's pure and clear, not depending on life and death. Then what is that one pure and clear thing that pulls this body around? And in the Dharma room uh, at Hope Street, the renovated funeral home, the uh, repurposed, I should say, funeral home, uh, he made a calligraphy, beautiful, he had beautiful and fabulous, bold uh, calligraphies. And then at the bottom, he translated, what is the one pure and clear thing? And as we would do walking meditation in a circle, round and round, Always I would pass that calligraphy and that question. It really became a koan for me, a beautiful koan. It was a more beautiful koan than the other ones I was supposed to be focusing on. What is that one pure and clear thing? And it really opened out into this um, just beautiful, profound, vast, uh, awareness. So these are some memories and teachings of my first beloved teacher, mm. the Reverend Sung San, uh, De San Sanim 